Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today, and thank you for coming to the talk. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. I'm I, I always, always very happy to, to be back. It feels like home. So uh, I'd like to discuss today uh, a little bit about my work in computational material science, computational materials physics, and the goal is um, I want to discuss about realizing Dirac's vision. I'll tell you more about it. It's, it's how to do predictive calculations of materials properties and particular quantum processes in semiconductors. So first of all, I have to talk about this one. So this is Professor Herman Daris advertising the colloquium on Facebook, and he pulls out photos from me from our first year in, in undergraduate. And I, I have to say, this is criminal. This is, this is supposed to be com very highly confidential photos that we're supposed to, to share so publicly on, on Facebook. So um, I, I don't even have this photo, so thank you very much for, for reminding me. Um, so uh, I'd like to recap also what uh, Professor Leopoldo just mentioned. So I got my degree in 2001. I joined the department in 1997 for my undergraduate. Um, it, it doesn't feel to me like so much so long ago, but it's almost 20 years. So I guess that's about the, the half-life of the department, right? So that's the characteristic time scale of the department's uh, process. So I was here in 2001 when I got my, my undergraduate degree. And then I went for my PhD in physics in UC Berkeley. Well, I learned more about uh, first basic calculations of uh, predictive materials properties. And after my PhD, I switched to materials. Uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara, where I learned how to apply these techniques to study functional materials properties, functional materials behavior. And since 2011, I've been faculty in materials science and engineering at the University of Michigan, uh, where I have the opportunity to work with uh, many uh, very productive colleagues and students uh, throughout the years. Um, all right, so, so what's Dirac's vision? Um, let me remind you this quote. Let's spend some time to, to read through this. Uh, Dirac was, of course, a very brilliant scientist. And even 90 years ago, uh, he uncovered uh, problems that still affect us today. So he realized that the equation he came up with was so fundamental and basic that it covered most of physics. The underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. The difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws these two equations much too complicated to be soluble. So we have the equations, we can solve them. So that his vision was that it becomes desirable to develop approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics, which can lead to explanation of the main features of complex atomic systems without too much computation. So, yeah, it, it isn't too true. 
Oh, yeah, so predictively solve a uh, Schrodinger's equation, right? This is this is the equation. This is the, the question for for matter. And and but many years ago, it was still it was already evident that computation is the challenge. Um, and going back, going back to the basic physics, the, the equation that describes the motion of uh, electrons in matter is the couple equation for electrons and nuclei. And the kinetic energy of electrons and ions, um, the repulsion between electrons, the attraction between the repulsion between the ions, and the electron ion interaction. This is a full quantum mechanical here. And the way to, to, to start this is we, of course, start with a Born and Behind approximation. Well, we take into account the fact that the electrons are so much lighter than the nuclei that they respond instantaneously to their motion. And so that allows us to separate them the two motions. Um, wherever the nuclei are, we can always assume that the electrons are in their ground state. While from the point of view of electrons, the nuclei are static. And moreover, we can make an approximation that the nuclei are classical particles. Um, mostly true, maybe some corrections for the lightest nuclei like hydrogen. But um, the de Broglie wavelength is, is so short that you can treat nuclei as basically as point particles using the laws of classical physics. And so here, even today, these are the main equations we need to, to worry about. Um, electrons, we still have to use quantum mechanics. Um, and we need to solve Schrodinger's equations where now only the electron coordinates are the quantum coordinates here. They have a kinetic energy, a repulsion between each other, and they get attracted by the nuclei. Uh, except the nuclei here are the positional parameters. And how we find those nuclear parameters? Well, from the classical equation of motion, mass. The equation yeah. square is missing, you see, the kinetic energy. Oh. Uh, del square. Oh, yes, yes, del square. Wow, thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah, I missed that. Yeah, this is the. the, the, the <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, wow. It's uh, good to have a, an eye for the details and the accuracy. Yeah, and then uh, from the, when it comes to the nuclei, uh, the force is coming from the electrons. The, the chemical bonds come from the electrons is what determines the motion of the nuclei. So we solve them, of course, together on, the same, uh, on a different footing, but at the same time to, to solve the dynamics of, of matter. Okay. And more details, of course, we can read about in your favorite quantum mechanical textbook. And of course, for us here is the book by Professor Trahanas. Uh, and I, I was very happy to find out that uh, Professor Trahanas translated his uh, book in, in English now, so everybody can, can learn from him. But as we, uh, those of us who, who grew up in the material, in the physics department here in Crete, for us, this is our original and, and only version that we've been using throughout the years. Uh, so thank you very much for all my education in quantum mechanics and with lots of love. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, going back to the basic quantum mechanics, we can understand this, this problem. Now I want, to I want to explain to you why quantum mechanics is still a challenge. We say, well, we have powerful computers today. Can we just give you the computer and solve it? First, um, an exercise, let's, let's, let's see the difference with quantum physics. In quantum physics, say, how much memory do you need, say, to store the classical state for a system with 10 electrons? And say, that's, say, the, the methane molecule. Uh, well, the answer here is that you have to, to describe the position and velocity for each of the particles. So you have three real numbers for the position, three for the velocity. You have six numbers for each particle, so you just need 48 bytes. For 10 of them, again, 480 bytes, so that's, that's trivial today's computer. Now, I want to contrast it with a full quantum mechanical picture. Now, suppose you want to describe the wave function for those same 10 electrons, right? Again, let's assume here we have this methane molecule. We put in a box, there's only 10 electrons. And we want to describe the wave function in real space. So we have to put real coordinates uh, to describe each of them. Let's, so let's say we need to solve this function. And we want to choose a resolution of 10 points per linear dimension. Okay. So how much memory do I need to store this wave function? Right. The answer is that this wave function is correlated. It involves the wave functions of the position of all electrons at the same time. So we have 10 three-dimensional variables. So for each of them, each of the position of each electron R1 can live in this box. So that's a 10 by 10 by 10 box. That's a 1,000 possible values for each of these variables. And we have 10 of these variables, so you put the 10th power. So you have 10 to the 30 possible values you need to know the wave function at. That is 10 to the 19 terabytes. That's about 1 billion hard drives for every person in this world. So there's no way to store this wave function, let alone calculate it. OK, so we have to do something approximate here. So, so even today, the brute force solution of Schrodinger's, of Schrodinger's equation is impossible. And this exponential complexity is what we're dealing with here. 
And one of the answers to this problem is density functional theory. Density functional theory balances a good predictive accuracy with a low computational cost. And the key observation here that gave Walter Korn his Nobel Prize in chemistry was that observation that the electron density is the key variable instead of the full wave function. The, number of the density of electrons per, per unit volume that gives the, density, the total number of electrons in your system. And with approximation, the key finding is that you can actually approximate the motion of electrons as non-interacting particles. So um, you, you can see a, a slight shading here. So instead of interacting electrons talk to each other through a Coulomb repulsion, what we have is independent electrons that move in an effective medium, an effective potential that acts as a local single particle potential that captures those effects of exchange and correlation. Okay. So the solution here is because we're then independent, we can just deal with a single steady determinant of independent particle wave functions. The key here is this fictitious system must have the same charge density and total energy as the real interacting electrons, but it's much easier to solve. The catch is, of course, we have to find what is this effective potential. Density functional theory, I want to emphasize, is not an approximation. Such a potential does exist. It's mathematically proven to exist. The catch is it's very hard to find. Uh, we, we don't have the exact closed analytical form for this potential. And that's where the approximations come in. Okay. So we can't, we can't, find the, uh, we can't predict it, uh, predictively uh, determine it, but we have some very good approximations today to describe the motion with very good accuracy. And of course, this potential depends on, also on, on the electrons themselves, so we need some sort of self-consistency to be able to, to describe the system in its entirety. Okay. So with this functional theory, the same problem is now we have 10 independent electrons. So now to find the wave function, we just need to describe those individual single particle wave functions. So each of them takes only 1,000 values in this case, so just 8 kilobytes. So for 10 electrons, we just need 80 kilobytes to store the collective consham wave functions, the density functional wave functions for this electron. So of course, that's of course feasible. Okay. And that's why you can increase the resolution and look at more electrons and everything. In fact, if you have twice as many electrons, you just need twice as much memory, not exponentially complex. And that makes it much easier to solve as well. We can, we can, today, with density functional theory, we can look at systems with thousands of atoms, and look at dislocation materials, we can look at uh, real crystals, and, uh, and predictively describe matter and chemistry at the atomic scale. All right, um, full disclosure, let me tell you what DFT does well and what it doesn't do well. Uh, it's great for ground state properties, when each electron occupies the lowest energy state available to it. Um, you can find, say, um, cohesive energy, uh, chemical reactions, the, the crystal structure, magnetic structure, the bonds and the angles, vibrations, all of them are very good because they're ground state properties. What it doesn't do well is excited state properties. Uh, the most famous one is the band gap. Uh, underestimates band gap by about the factors of two. Uh, things like optical absorption. Also, it doesn't do well for, for systems where correlations become important, like D electrons or F electrons, where you have strong magnetic interactions or superconductivity, um, and all those, those issues become much more challenging. And last, it doesn't always include van der Waals forces, so you have to do corrections to include them properly because they are dynamical uh, and much more complex than covalent or ionic interactions. Right. So what my, what my work focuses on is on excited state properties. In the ground state, every electron occupies the lowest energy state available to it. But what we're looking for is also excitations, when you add an electron or add a hole to your system, that's a single particle excitation, or when you add both of them to create an electron-hole pair, like in an optical experiment. And those kinds of uh, excitations matter when you talk about a solar cell or an LED. And so let me tell you what we do on top of DFT to correct for this deficiency. So again, we always start with this functional theory to find the ground state properties, uh, crystal structure, enthalpy, vibrations, and wave functions. But as you see here, this is a, a plot of the band gaps we get from DFT compared to experiment. Of course, you want to be on the straight line. DFT underestimates those back, uh, band gaps dramatically, typically by a factor of two for most semiconductors. But some of them, like germanium or indium nitride, are predicted to be metals. And that's a very big problem. Okay. So the way to correct this is we use many body perturbation theory in the lowest order of Feynman diagrams, and that's the GW method. G is Green's functions and W is the screen Coulomb interaction. And that gives much more accurate band gaps, typically within 0.1 electron volts from experiment. And that's how we can predictively find band structures whether in their full complexity. 
And now this is enough to get bang ups right, but if you want to look at optics and these two particle excitations, you need to go one more step and solve for the excitonic wave functions with the two particle by the Salpeter equation. And that's how you get optical properties. And this is the case of silicon. Uh, the dashed line you see here, this is the uh, dielectric function of silicon, the imaginary part, uh, otherwise the absorption, if you use the GW method. So with this method, you get the peak positions right because you have a correct band structure, but you don't get the peak heights. And to get the peak heights properly, you must include these correlations um, in coming from excitons. Uh, when it comes to more complex systems with coupled also with Schlenger Poisson equations, and you can read more about this also in a review paper uh, I wrote, as well as you can hear from the local experts like uh, Yanis Remediakis or George Kopidakis, and uh, also um, um, among many others at the University of Crete. All right, and one more thing I focus on in my research is the interaction of electrons and phonons. So we can solve for, each, uh, for the Latin and the electrons separately, but of course the two of them couple to each other as well. There's two ways to look at their motion. One is that if you add an electron to your material, it's going to distort the lattice around it. The electron being negative, it attracts the positive cations and repels the negative anions, and it creates this localized distortion that is basically, in essence, it's a vibration, it's a phonon. On the other hand, as phonons vibrate, as they vibrate due to a phonon mode, they break translation symmetry. So an electron that would otherwise propagate freely in the crystal, according to Bloch's theorem, now can get scattered by the vibration. So these are two ways to, to look at the problem. And of course, it gives rise to many, many important phenomena in materials. Um, first of all, it changes, it, it renormalizes electron properties. It changes its effective mass, it changes the band gap, the velocities, and all their properties. It also gives rise to superconductivity uh, in the BCS mechanism. The, the emission of a phonon by an electron, the reabsorption by another electron, is what gives the positive attraction between these two electrons and gives rise to the, to the gap opening at the Fermi surface. Uh, also, this is a polaron, basically. The electron, along with the crystal distortion around it, as it travels through the crystal, that's a new kind of particle that's the polaron that may even get self-trapped or not. Uh, and also, carrier transport. The scattering of those electrons is what gives rise to the fundamental conductivity and mobility of materials. What I focus on my research is uh, optical properties that are mediated by phonons, as well as non additive combination or Auger combination, also assisted by phonon vibrations. So those are the main topics that I'd like to talk about today. The first is how phonons enable optical properties that would otherwise be forbidden by symmetry, and also how this kind of quantum processes mediated by phonons uh, play a big role in the performance of nitride and optoelectronic devices. So I'll start first with phonon-assisted optics, and I'll start, of course, with a fundamental semiconductor, which is silicon. So so I'll describe, uh, again, this is the absorption spectrum of silicon as a function of the energy of the photons. And we see, here's the data from experiment, the dots. And here's uh, the red lines are the best theory we have. And you can see we agree very well with experiment. And even we capture the effects of temperature, right? So you see here, from 0 to 676 six, Kelvin, we can capture how this absorption works uh, very well. And that accounts for the direct absorption of electrons from the valence band to the conduction band through vertical transitions. Okay, so this is that we, we do understand how silicon absorbs light. But if you noticed, all these spectra are in the ultraviolet. Okay, Be uh, because the first direct optical excitation of silicon is at about 3.5 electron volts, which corresponds to ultraviolet wavelengths. When it comes though to the sil to the visible spectrum, the visible part. That one is only, be the, you need the phonon to absorb there. The difference between the 1.2 gap, the indirect gap, and the direct gap, that's basically the entire visible spectrum. And you need this kind of absorption to explain how silicon solar cells work. Without phonons, silicon will be transparent, and you won't be able to make a solar cell based on silicon. Okay? So we need to uh, be able to, uh, to understand this. And so the way we do this uh, is with second order perturbation theory where now our perturbation is the coupled effects of the electron-photon interaction along with the electron-photon interaction. And so here is Fermi's golden rule to second order. So the transition from an initial to a final state has to go through an intermediate state M. We have to sum over all those states and then square because it's a quantum coherent process. We have to account the phases as well. And then conserve energy with this delta function. Uh, of course, this Hamiltonian is the sum of the two. So uh, to study foreign assisted optics, we keep only the cross terms. 
were first to have electron photon followed by electron phonon or phonon followed by photon absorption. And we have to sum through different sets of intermediate states, of course. And in a more diagram drama diagrammatic picture, this is what it looks like. So an, an electron from the valence band can get excited the conduction band through two possible paths, either photon absorption first, followed by photon emission, or photon emission followed by photon absorption. And, and the, the two paths are just different permutations of optical matrix elements across the band gap, as well as electron phonon matrix elements to describe the strength of electron phonon interaction. Okay, but if you uh, put everything in here, this is how you're able to find the absorption coefficient in units of inverse length and compare directly to experiment. Okay. Um, let me tell you now what is the challenge. Um, when I first started this project, I thought that this is something that must have been done years ago um, because it's such a simple system, such a simple interaction. It turns out that also one of these problems which are computationally very expensive, even within density functional theory. The reason is we have this double sum over all possible states. In, in direct absorption, we have a single sum. So we have to sum over uh, integrate over the Brillouin zone once. But for foreign assist, we have to sum over all possible initial and all, over all possible final states. So if you want a good energy resolution, such as 30 mV, let's say, in your spectrum, you need grids which are quite fine in this zone. So if you square them, you get about 200 million combinations. And although each of them may take, say, an, an hour, when you go to 200 million hours, that becomes quite substantial, even for modern supercomputers. So we'll develop some new techniques here based on Wanier functions. So we convert from the block basis to the Wanier basis, especially a tight binding basis, which allows us to describe the interactions in a localized basis set. And that's short range, and those interactions decay very fast with space. So we convert the Wanier basis, which allows to calculate to interpret the band structure and the optical matrix elements. But another very recent development is the interpolation of the electron phonon coupling matrix element, because this is really the bottleneck. How to describe the um, coupling of an electron at state k to one at state k plus q through the absorption emission of a phonon with wave vector q. But if you fully transform to a localized basis, uh, the localized Wanier functions and the localized atomic displacement only interact if they're very close to each other. And when they're further apart, those uh, interactions decay exponentially, so you don't need many of them to converge your, your, your description. And that's how we use uh, within this uh, EPW code to, to model the, uh, the, 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 all the greens you need for the interpolation. And by putting this together, here's what we get. Uh, this is the absorption coefficient of silicon as a function of photon energy, and near the onset, where you see we have two different terms, one coming from photon emission and one from photon absorption. You can capture both of them as a function of temperature as well. Uh, one catch here is that we had to shift the onset of energy because these are Final details need high level of theory to capture properly. But otherwise, we must explain very well, uh, particularly also the temperature dependence of this onset. Um, now, this is something you can perhaps do also with some sort of effective matrix element and effective electron coupling. But what really, uh, the, 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 what really shows the complexity of the problem is how to find the full absorption spectrum in the entire visible. And, uh, so, the, because here, uh, we have to consider the entire Brillouin zone. And this is where Simple models don't work very well, and you need the full calculation. So by doing this, we're able to find the uh, very good agreement of the experiment over several orders of magnitude of the absorption coefficient. And as far as I know, uh, this work from 2012 is the first calculation, a fully predictive calculation of how silicon absorbs visible light and, and in turn enables the operation of silicon solar cells. Um, so we've published this, and we've still been built on this theory to study, to study more effects, uh, such as how uh, transparent conductors absorb. Um, you need transparent conductor in devices because you want a material that would conduct electricity without absorbing light. Uh, you need this, for example, on a solar cell or on your cell phone, so you can touch the screen and get a response uh, without blocking the light coming through. Usually, for that purpose, we use uh, wide band gap oxides, like tin oxide, with a band gap in the ultraviolet, so light can't excite electrons across the gap, yet um, it can conduct electricity because it's very heavily doped, n-type usually. And, and these n-type electrons, though, can absorb light, again, through the assistance of phonons, and I can go this intraband transition um, to absorb visible light. Again, a, a free electron in a vacuum can't absorb photon by itself. It needs some extra momentum, 
and that momentum has to come from somewhere. In the case of materials, primarily through phonons. And again, our calculations here are able to tell us what are the fundamental limits to transparency in conducting oxides. If when you dope an oxide, uh, of course, you get more connectivity, but you also get less transparency. So there's a balance there. And our results are able to tell us uh, how this balance works in real materials. Um, and here's a good coincidence, actually. The absorption is the least in the visible. As you go to longer wavelengths, you get more absorption or more reflection. But as you go to the UV, you also start to get more absorption even through those free carriers. And right where we want the material to be transparent, that's where it happens to be. So that's a, a very good coincidence. And one more thing I want to talk about absorption is the free carrier absorption in silicon. And now again, the silicon can be doped, either N-type or P-type, here focus on N-type materials. So those uh, free electrons in silicon can also absorb light and can either then go a direct transition to this next conduction band, or they can absorb light through the phonon and undergo this intraband transition. So here we put them all together, the direct, the phonon assisted, the defect assisted, and what we see is in different parts of the infrared spectrum, you have different kinds of contributions. And when we sum them up together, you see that we're in very good agreement with the experiment over, again, several orders of magnitude of, of dopants. And we're able to explain that this uh, shoulder feature you see here, that's coming from this direct term because we have this second band here to absorb light. And this result matters when you want to make a solar cell because the solar cell is a p-n junction, so you have to sandwich a p-type material with an n-type material and those dopants can absorb the photons before they reach the junction, and that's where you may lose them to, to phone assisted optics. Okay. All right, so now let me switch to uh, discuss a bit of nitrides, because nitrides LEDs are one of the most important technologies out there. Um, nitride materials are used to make LEDs in the uh, high energy part of the visible, like blue, cyan, green, and violet. And together with arsenides, now we can have colors in every part of the visible, including uh, white LEDs you can get through a phosphor conversion. And now you can buy light bulbs that contain this technology. And this work has been recognized by the Nobel Prize in Physics a few years ago, thanks to the uh, huge commercial success that these devices have had. And the reason for the success is the nitride materials. Uh, in particular, if you look at 35 semiconductors, uh, traditional ones, you see you can't get to very wide band gaps. You are limited to the red, uh, orange, maybe yellow part of the spectrum. But with the nitrides, in particular the alloy of gallium nitride with indium nitride, you can cover the whole visible. In fact, this material, the indium gallium nitride alloy, it's, it's unique. It's the only material that has a direct band gap that can be tuned over the entire visible spectrum. No other material can do that. Uh, notice, though, that there is a large lattice mismatch between the two. It's about 10%. And this is very hard to, 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 to so it's very hard to grow a high indium content alloys on top of gallium nitride. Nevertheless, you can go and buy LEDs in the violet, blue, cyan, and green. There are some yellow ones, but it's really hard to push it to, to the red and, and the amber wavelength. So that, that, that still remains a challenge. Okay, so some challenge that could happen with LEDs is, uh, sure, you can go and buy them at the store right now, but why do we still research them? One big issue is what we call the efficiency drew problem. That those LEDs are amazingly efficient, uh, almost 90% efficient, as long as the power is low. But if you try to crank up the power, say to illuminate a room, then their efficiency starts to drop. So the power you get out is not as much as the power you put in. The efficiency peaks and then drops as you go uh, to high, high currents. And the other is that this efficiency becomes worse as you go towards longer wavelengths. If you focus on violet LEDs, you can get 80% efficient LEDs, right? But as you push to the green or yellow, your efficiency drops, right? And that's the maximum efficiency. So there is this region near the green where we do not have efficient LEDs of any technology. So again, that, that's a, a very big challenge as well. And of course, the materials also suffer from many other issues, which I won't go in, in deep detail, like polarization effects that separate the recombination, as well as these fluctuations that cause the carrier localization, like Anderson localization of carriers, and, and further degrade the efficiency. Uh, what I want to focus on is what is the cause of this efficiency droop? One of the hypotheses is that it is caused by non-radiative recombination. That is, um, again, here's the conduction band and the valence band of a semiconductor. So the electron recombines with a hole, but instead of a photon coming out, what happens is 
another electron steals that energy and goes to a higher band. Uh, Auger spectroscopy has been used a lot to characterize materials. In this case, we've got low energy Auger effects, not the, not the level of X rays, but the level of uh, single EVs. And then that electron loses the energy to, to heat. And of course, because it involves many carriers, uh, it becomes more important at high power when you have more and more of these carriers. So our goal here is to evaluate. Um, so the, so the, the rate here grows with a third part of the density because you need three carriers for Roger to happen. Um, and this prefactor C, that's a material property that tells us how strong the effect will be in any material. So our goal is to evaluate this function C and see whether it explains what happens in, in LEDs. So the first thing we did is we looked at how the direct Augeric combination, at, uh, what's the value for gallium nitride. So we did a theory, and the number we found is about 10 to the minus 33 in these units. But then we did an experiment, and the number we find is this much. So we're off by two to three orders of magnitude. So, so that's bad. Uh, we can't explain such large uh, coefficients, right? And the reason is that if you look at a general trend for materials for this Auger coefficient C, um, you observe the following trend. If you look at direct gap materials, this Auger coefficient decreases exponentially as you increase the material band gap. And the reason is the wider the band gap, the harder it becomes to conserve energy and momentum simultaneously. There's no way to, to match a uh, band up here. So by the time you reach gallium nitride, this direct OG, of course, it's a very weak process. On the other hand, though, gallium nitride follows this other trend, which is formed by indirect gap materials, which point to the fact that uh, when direct processes are not, not allowed, maybe indirect processes start to take over, like a process that's mediated by some sort of scattering, like, like phonons or alloy disorder or some other effect. And of course, we think of phonons first because they exist in any material. Uh, even at zero temperature, you can always emit a phonon. So that's what we looked at. Again, we'll go back to, to basic quantum mechanics. We've got French golden rule. And to find the total rate of uh, recombination here, uh, we have to factor in whether those states are occupied or not. Again, we have to go from occupied to empty states, hence those Fermi factors. We have to conserve momentum, and we have to conserve energy. And our perturbation here, the reason why those patterns can exchange energy is the Coulomb interaction. And that can be a direct term or an exchange term and with a minus sign to account for the uh, Fermi um, transition. Uh, and of course, we take this to a second order to factor in phonons. In this case, this is what the diagrams look like. So here we added one more diagram to account for this electron phonon coupling to an intermediate state. And we have all the ingredients we need uh, to calculate these rates. Okay, uh, I know the math gets a little heavy here, so I'll summarize to the conclusion. Long story short, if you factor in the effect of alloy disorder and phonons, you can explain what happens in commercial blue LEDs. Okay, so here's the, how the Auger coefficient depends on the various mechanisms, and you see our total values now are in the range between 10 to the minus 31 to 10 to the minus 30, which is exactly what experiment sees. So, so here's the story. In, in LED, what you want to happen is you want an electron in a hole to recombine and give you a photon. What may happen is when you have high power, you have another electron that steals that energy of the recombination. So you don't get a photon, you get this darkness. But for this to happen, you need one more mechanism to take the momentum. The carrier gets the energy, the momentum is taken by the that's vibration or scattering to an impurity. And that's what happens in commercial LEDs and explains the reason why uh, the efficiency drops at high power. Yeah, yeah. The impurity is not something that we know mm. for sure. Exactly. Material, Precisely. Mm. So yeah, very good question. Yeah, so yeah, the question is, how do we factor in the defect contribution right here? That's an excellent question. So here we assume a high concentration of defects. I think we assume 10 to 19, which is usually high for the kind of materials that, that we have here. And we only factor in the, the uh, the, the Coulomb scattering from those defects, not any extra states in the band gap. But of course, as you said, at any given sample, if you have defects, they may introduce new states in the gap that may completely change the picture. So yeah, you're right. We, we start from a more fundamental mechanism and try to expand the complexity step by step. So let's first look at direct processes, then phonons, then alloy disorder. And then for any given defect, we can see how much it will influence the Auger coefficient and at what concentration. You're absolutely right. The, the first thing we look at is the, the charge defects because those are always introduced for, des they're desirable for doping. But uh, we found we need very high concentration to explain experiment, yeah. Uh, 
This is bulk precisely. This is for no quantum wells yet. Yeah, for quantum wells, um, the, the scale of scattering has to be at the atomic level. That's why effects like alloying matters and phonons matter. We think the quantum wells, typically three nanometers, they can cause scattering as well. The scale is so large, though, that I don't think it will be a very strong effect. And others have done calculations for, for, these, um, uh, for quantum wells. The numbers were not large. Uh, phonons and alloy terms were actually larger than those calculations for, for, for quantum wells. I don't think it, plays a, it may play a big role if you have a, uh, more confinement, but, but perhaps not here. Yeah. A very good point. In, in, actually, in quantum wells, there are also other terms that play a big role, like polarization fields. And that, that plays a much bigger role. That's what we found. Um, I, I can tell you more, more details, perhaps. Uh, I, I didn't expand much on the, on the field polarization fields here. Um, but one thing we, we try to explain is, now that we know what is the cause of the efficiency problems, maybe we can start to discuss what can we do to improve on it. Um, unfortunately, what we found is that the mechanism of Auger combination is fundamental to the nitrides. It's intrinsic. You can't get rid of it. If you have to make an alloy, you have alloy disorder. If you have phon phonons are there at any temperature. So one solution is actually to reduce the carrier density. What if we have less carriers but still have a bright LED? So the inclination here is to, uh, for a given current coming in, to get your carrier density to be smaller is, what can you do to spread those carriers over a thicker region, over a, a, a more, more material, basically? Uh, the problem is, as we discussed earlier, that this alloy is not lattice much to gallium nitride. There's a lot of strain if you try to grow it thicker. So typically, we grow these wells up to 3 nanometers. And more than that starts to cause dislocations, uh, imperfections. And that, 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 that's bad. Uh, so being a physicist says, oh, well, you can grow it thicker. What happens in the other extreme? What if we make those quantum wells as thin as possible? Uh, and one reason, actually, is uh, to control also the emission wavelength through quantum confinement. Again, going back to fundamental quantum mechanics, what happens if I take a material and reduce its dimensions, its particle in the box, down to few atoms? Uh, what we aim to achieve here is gallium nitride its wave can be pushed into the deep ultraviolet, while indium nitride, which is in the infrared, can perhaps emit in the visible. And there are many good reasons to do this, because uh, you don't need to worry as much about lattice mismatch for these few layer structures. Uh, you have large band offsets, so you can actually trap carriers in those thin quantum wells. And you, can, um, you also get good confinement to increase the overlap of those electrons and holes. Um, but one more reason is actually you can form strongly bound excitons, even at room temperature. Basic, um, and that's what we, we hope to achieve. And first of all, let me prove to you that this is not science fiction. Uh, those quantum wells have been grown by my uh, colleague, Debdeep Jenna, at the University of Notre Dame and Cornell University. So I'll talk about quantum wells of gallium nitride inside aluminum nitride barriers, which are just one monolayer or two monolayer thick, with barriers which are also very, very thin. And by the way, some work like in this area has also been done by our, our, our colleagues, uh, a group of TD Mustakas. Uh, and also, uh, I want to emphasize here also that the great growth work uh, taking place here in the group of the nitrides, Professor Pelecanos and Georg Achilles, uh, as well, are very familiar with the MB growth of those materials. So, so those can be made. And this is like an embedded 2D material and semiconductor compatible with existing technology. And what we found is that if you reduce the dimensions of gallium nitride to monolayers, your band gap goes from 3.4 EV all the way to up to 5.4. That's a huge change. So two entire electron volts coming from confinement. And also indium nitride indeed goes into the visible and the yellow part if you decrease it down to one monolayer. But there's another reason we want to look at this. Not just uh, the change in the wavelength, but also the fact that you form strongly bound excitons. In inorganic semiconductors, most of them have small exciton binding energies on the order of 20 to 30 millivy. So temperature, uh, room temperature KBT is 25 millivy. It's enough to break them apart and gives you free electrons and holes. But what happens in those extremely quantum confined materials is that electrons and holes are so strongly bound to each other that they start to form excitons with a binding energy of 200 millivy. And that starts to approach the value of organic LEDs, which are excitonic or 2D materials. So instead of free carriers, we have excitons at room temperature. And when you form excitons, their lifetimes become much, much shorter. They combine so much faster, and they give you luminescence 
on a scale of nanoseconds, like 50 times faster uh, than free carriers at room temperature. And this faster combination could be a source behind improving the efficiency of those LEDs. So, uh, of course, we look at the recombination rate. Uh, we're still working on understanding the non relative combination rate. But we have some good evidence that it's also going to be low in these materials because they're binary. You don't have alloy disorder, and also the large band gaps help. OK, so, uh, so what we found is that uh, this extreme confinement changes the physics of electrons and holes in LEDs. So it gives us free excitons, which recombine much faster and allow for higher efficiency. But I want to revisit also this question of making LEDs thicker. And one idea we had has to do with boron. Uh, again, remember, we want to focus on this alloy, the indium gallium nitride. And ideally, we want materials right here. We want to put indium to reduce the bank of gallium into the visible range, but we don't want to uh, cause too much lattice mismatch. We want to build exact epitaxial on gallium nitride. So we thought about boron. Boron is an atom much smaller than gallium or indium. So what you can do is you can, if you co-alloy indium and boron at the same time, you can perhaps balance each other, balance their opposite strains, and get materials in this part of the spectrum. Now, aluminum can balance the strain, but it will give you a larger band gap, and we want to go to lower band gaps. A long story short, it does. Putting boron and indium at a ratio of 2 to 3 almost eliminates completely the mismatch uh, compared to indium gallium nitride. And at the same time, it gives us band gaps very similar to ingan alloys of the same indium content. And long story short, here's the plot we get. So again, uh, combining gallium nitride, allowing both boron and indium, gives us the materials we want. They're at the same lattice constant as gallium nitride, but their band gaps now span the, the visible. And, and, and the reason here is, again, that the uh, compressive strain caused by indium is compensated by the tensile strain from boron, and the two of them cancel each other out and give you this constant the same as gallium nitride. And that allows us to grow these uh, wells to be as thick as you want without causing dislocations. Uh, and so that, that we hope that this will reduce the combination and improve the efficiency, and also allows you to put more indium into your quantum wells so you can reach longer wavelengths, perhaps covering this green, amber, red gap with a single material. And we just published this paper earlier this, this year. So here's a long story short, how we can use quantum mechanics to study quantum processes that matter more than technological devices. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators and the sources of funding. And again, I'd like to thank you for your invitation to be here today. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much.
Has anybody tried uh, experimentally? Yeah, they could get into as uh, so experimentally. There's more work done on putting boron into pure gallium nitride or pure aluminum nitride. Uh, there is only a couple of ways <coughs> of putting boron into inga. Uh, typically, uh, the amount is two percent boron and about ten percent indium. So, we, we, uh, so I don't think this this, this uh, balance of strength has been observed. Yet. This has been named. Uh, there is some discussion about. How much you can actually realize the materials because the, the amount of boron you put in is, is limited. Experimentally, uh, you can put about 3% boron into calcium nitride because before you start causing secondary phases to form. So, the about 5%, it, it's really kind of a challenge. How can you incorporate the boron into calcium? We we'll think indium helps because here in indium compacts the strain, so it reduces the enthalpy of mixing boron into inga as opposed to, to pure can. And so, we, we think that we can put up to 5% boron, which means about 7% indium, which it starts to approach the UV wave, the, 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 the violet wave, and it starts to bring it down. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that there's more work done trying to put both at the same time in this exact ratio. And, and also, uh, boron into indium, I think we have only one reference of putting boron into indium nitride. So this is it's really a, a, a large, large and explored field. There are so many questions to answer. Uh, if I understand whether the approach to that you propose, more or less, except of uh, the modern alloy, mm -hmm. is to uh, to reach the green uh, gap, is to use the indium nitride, but in what? That don't be the If well, what should be the thickness? Um, you know, I think the critical thickness of indium and gallium nitride is a single monolayer. I think it's more less beyond the critical thickness, and they should be grown. Uh, by this well, right? That more in single models of indium nitride have been grown on, on gallium nitride. This is another question. Oh, if you think that's the more layers of 33%. Oh, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, this, um, one question is whether those contain some gallium, and you're at 33%, there could be an ordered structure forming there, or if it, it, or it could be fully disordered, and, and you are acting in the, the, the ordered structure can give you violent emission. If it's fully in your nitride, it will give you yellow emission with it. And, and, and it's not about the exponents. Yeah. But I think you're right, beyond on the layer, that, 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 that's what I'm for. Uh, Do you think it's like how the patient you think? Uh, yes, it's, 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 it's very small. Uh, actually, these are actual wave functional calculations. So this is the red lines, this is what comes out of this functional theory. Uh, the dashed line is just a guide to the eye. And as you see, uh, even though you have a huge polarization field here, the two curves are very well overlapping because there's just no room for them to separate. That's one more reason to, to make them very, very thin. The fields are strong, but there's no space to separate them. So can they do it if you have something so, so small, another polarization field effect is so little? It, it just, just because, so yeah, it's just because they're so different. The approach, the normal approach of the Mesorok Yermazon completely yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I think also in for some you will find the overlap to be large. Because the, it's a center of space. There's no yes. space. Usually it usually doesn't have much speaker, so uh, the field state goes one side goes to the other, but it's, but here the scale is compared to the rest of the wave function, they still overlap almost hundred percent. Any other question? I have one thousand one questions about the more Simple one, apart from the difficulty of obtaining the lab and uh, putting in a form there, do the calculations, first of all, why two to three? Two to three, good question. Uh, this is the first time we tried. Um, so, one reason is that uh, here's value monetary. So, indium is 10% larger, boron is 15% smaller. So, this right. is the so you divide. <laughs> right. so the other question is. is do the calculation correspond to the random alloy? Very good question, yeah. So this is a random alloy, yes. A random worldside alloy is that you no, would not expect really to be very random in such a very... Uh, That's a good question. Whether you have short range attraction, you are right, because what, what I would expect intuitively is that boron and endium may have some short range correlations. Because if they're next to each other, their strains will cancel out locally. And that would reduce the energy. As opposed to that separate, where each one has their own strain fields. 
So here's an energy term that would favor the attraction. And one thing that you hear was an entropy term would favor the dissociation of those pairs. So it would be a competition that's so we're working actually on this aspect. How to look at various degrees of ordering and look at the competition between ordering more and entropy versus dissociating and getting a favor of creation. point of view, always you can put the order or the sort of right? Exactly. So how much the picture changes mm -hmm. if you go from the random alloy to completely ordered? No, 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 yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah, actually, we're, we're exploring this question, making it a little more applied. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll look at the fantasy aspects indeed. But yes, if I want to look at uh, our random ones, we also look at the beyond the 2 3 ratio, and we see that, that, that you can always find the composition to completely eliminate the mismatch between the two and still cover the whole piece with a fully random one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Manos, again.